Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research. And normally, it's an interview-based podcast with one, maybe two guests, where I ask a number of different questions. This episode, however, is part of a unique series that I'm running within the podcast called Psychedelic Cafes. The difference is that instead of it being an interview with many questions to one person, it is a structured conversational space, a digital sharing circle with many people surrounding just one question. This structured conversational space is a type of conversational technology called Dharma talking, which was developed by Gene Robertson of the Liminal Space Agency, which is a meta monastery here in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, where I live. Gene's been on the show previously, and I highly recommend checking it out. The episode is called Humanity 3.0 and the Collaborative Mindset, and I will link it in the description here. Dharma talking unfolds over three rounds. Each of the specifics of each round are going to be explained at their opening throughout the course of the cafe you're about to step into. But again, it all surrounds a central question. And the question for this episode is... What does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? The people that we've got on this episode, um, in this cafe, on this question are Anna Lakaitis, Dale McLeod, Benjamin Mudge, Michelle Ann Hobart, Kyle Buller, and Dr. Nicole Gruel. Exactly who they are, their bios, and how to get a hold of them is going to be uh, in the description or in the show notes to this episode at jameswbjesso.com, which will be linked in the description wherever you're checking this out. So jump over there to learn more about each guests um, and not reading their bios here to save for introductory time. Um, we're about to get into the cafe, but first, I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube. Without Patreon, without my patrons, without the voluntary contribution of financial energy, of of money, straight up money, into the show, I would not be able to have the reliable income foundation that allows me to commit full time to the show and the larger body of work that holds it. Especially, I wouldn't be able to produce it in a way that maintains total creative control, has zero upfront cost to experience it, and ultimately isn't littered with a lot of ads. So um, thank you to my patrons for allowing this and helping this happen. I really appreciate it. If you're not yet a patron of the show and you'd like to become one, go to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso, where you can sign up to pledge as little as a cup of coffee once a month to contribute into that reliable income foundation, which I lean into while I full-time work on the show and produce this for everyone. So please head over and do that. If you'd like to leave a one-time donation, you can do so by um, PayPal or Bitcoin. Uh, Options to do that, sorry, the links are in the description of this episode as well. So that's it. We're about to step into the Psychedelic Cafe But uh, I'd like to warn you in advance that being that we're talking about spiritual crisis, we also talk about mental health crisis, which means we talk about some pretty intense, sensitive things at a few points, um, including suicide as well as sexual assault. So these are topics that you will experience when you listen to the show. So if now is not the right time for you to be encountering that kind of content, now might not be the right time to listen to this episode. But nonetheless, that warning uh, sort of like established. Uh, Here we are. This is the Psychedelic Cafe number six here on Adventures Through the Mind, exploring the question of what does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? Can I get a nod? Everyone's ready to go. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Psychedelic Cafe. Uh, This is a structured conversational space that's going to move through three rounds plus introductions at the beginning. I will introduce each round um, as we get into the beginning of that round. So to start us off, uh, we will go through and do some introductions. So please tell us your name, who you are, and why you're here. Uh, And we will go in the order of, based on how I see people on my screen, Dale, Nicole, Michelle, Benjamin, Kyle, and Anna. 
So, and then myself at the end. Hi, I'm Dale McLeod. And I believe that I'm here because of the book that I wrote called The Big Dream, My Terrifyingly Beautiful Shamanic Initiation into the Arts, which tells the story of my shamanic awakening that was really catalyzed by um, ayahuasca and magic mushrooms. Um, So it was definitely a spiritual crisis, one that I spent years working through. And uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dr. Nicole Grohl here. And uh, I think I'm here because uh, I work with people who have had spiritual awakenings. Uh, They've uh, gone through certain experiences. They are questioning their reality. They're questioning their experience. They're questioning their sanity. And uh, they're trying to find their feet in terms of the new life that has awoken through them and within them. Um, And so we work together to structure what that might look like walking in and through the world whilst integrating what needs to be integrated, pulling through the bits of wisdom that need to come through and, um, yeah, walking forth in new ways. My name is Michelle Ann Hobart, and I am a spiritual emergence coach. And I had my own spiritual emergency in uh, 2013. And I wrote a book about my lived experience and um, clinical uh, experience through a studying at CIAS. Um, and that book is Holding Sacred Space. Um, and I work uh, specifically with psychic opening, uh, Kundalini awakening, and near death experience and how all those types of openings um, create the possibility for awakening into our gifts and how to navigate those gifts and bring uh, them out into the world to be of service at this time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Benjamin Mudge, and I think I've been invited here because I perhaps bridged the gap between mainstream psychiatry and what is more interestingly called spiritual emergence. And uh, I myself am bipolar. I've been a patient in the psychiatric system and I healed that with ayahuasca and now I'm doing a PhD in psychiatry department uh, about ayahuasca for bipolar disorder. So I'm looking at the, you know, I, I have an understanding of how psychiatrists and scientists and neurobiologists define these things. And I also have a personal experience and a very much a spiritual awareness of these states of consciousness and uh yeah i'm also the director of bipolar disorder cic a not-for-profit community interest company working for bipolar people's interests thank you james and everyone awesome uh, my name is kyle buller i'm a co-founder and director of education and training at psychedelics today um, why am I here? Uh, spiritual emergence has been a big part of my life. Uh, I had a near-death experience when I was 16, um, ended up doing my undergrad in transpersonal psychology, my master's in counseling, um, and psychedelics have been a huge part of my life, uh, you know, being able to, I guess, uh, run psychedelics today. And I also have spent some time working with uh, people experiencing early episode psychosis at a uh, residential home called Soteria, Vermont. Um, even though they didn't classify a spiritual emergence, um, you know, it was kind of within that framework of, you know, what could be labeled as psychosis, schizophrenia versus what could be like a spiritual emergency. Um, also uh, went through a spiritual emergence coaching program by Emma Bragdon at IMHU. Um, and just really excited to be here. So thanks for the invitation and looking forward to the conversation. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lukaitis. Um, I'm a PhD candidate from Sydney, Australia, and my PhD research is looking at the phenomenology of the psilocybin experience. Um, However, I think I'm here today because my master's research looked at um, meditation adverse effects, which um, so that's the, the technical research term for challenging and distressing experiences that can occur as a result of meditation practice. And um, if these experiences are not um, supported, then they can lead to what you might term a spiritual crisis.
And I'm James Jesso, and I'm here because uh, this is my podcast, and I am facilitating this discussion, and I am excited about this topic and each of you who are here today. Um, it's interesting to say that I'm excited about a topic that causes so much distress in people's lives. Um, okay, so that is our introductions. Let's move into the first round. So... Uh, the first round is that we will all share one clear, coherent thought on the question, what does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? And we'll go in the same order as we did before, Dale, Nicole, Michelle, Benjamin, Kyle, and Anna. And if you're not yet ready to share that, oh, and then myself, and if you're not yet ready to share that thought, you can pass and we'll come back to you at the end. Pass. What does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? My understanding is that it is an awakening to more of who we are. Um, it's a rough way of awakening to more of who we are. There are many ways that it can happen. Um, and it's also an incredibly natural part of that awakening. So, you know, as babies, we come into the world and it's so easy to see growth of babies. We just have to watch them. And each day something new happens each month. Children, the same case. But when it comes to our adulthood, young adulthood and beyond, we kind of switch off to what it means to grow as a human being, to grow and develop. And what I've really come to see through my own experience, through working with so many others who go through this, is this is completely natural. There is an unfolding that happens into what it means to be a human being in a body on this crazy, wild planet. And so a spiritual awakening or an awakening into the more that is, the more that we are opening our eyes to simply more of the reality with the big R that is always in existence is simply another natural stage and phase and series of rolling experiences on that road. To have it as a spiritual crisis can be when that can happen very quickly. It can happen too fast for our regular everyday world, the so-called normal that we live in to catch up with. Um, and so the, the, the place from where we were to where we find ourselves if we're in crisis to where we're headed can be very condensed, can be quite crazy and wild, and the integrating of that can be incredibly challenging. Hmm. So what is a spiritual crisis? What makes it a crisis um, is the fact that it can be so much content, so much energy, so much opening that happens that um, needs to be held in, uh, in a way that's really honoring. And um, in order to be able to deal with the trauma that may have catalyzed it, the trauma that may have been underneath that got activated in the process itself, um, and potentially even the trauma of the system and its response to the experience. So for me, we're really talking about, um, in a spiritual crisis, we're talking about how do we hold space for that? How do we hold sacred space? How do we honor the person's reality? Because um, as each one of us that goes through these experiences um, we may realize that we are actually being called forth. We're being called into action. And the openings that, um, that, that I experience with myself and with my clients are that these, um, these experiences provide the opportunity to see things in a new way and um, in a very specific way, in a unique way that actually allows for the new paradigm to be birthed and that we each are carriers of that. And that it's uh, important that we cultivate and facilitate and honor um, these, these beings that are coming online, that are popping, whether it's in ceremony intentionally or spontaneously or having kundalini awakenings, um, or that trauma itself catalyzes the experience, um, especially now that we're in 
um, another resurgence of, of the psychedelic uh, movement, there is um, such a need for um, ethical space holding and a need for, um, for deeper ways of understanding what integration looks like and how to do that in a way. Um, and to, for me, education is, is so important. Um, that we get um, this information about spiritual emergence and emergency into um, into the hands and into the hearts of of guides and facilitators and um, spiritual teachers that um, that we really can provide the opportunity for um, the, the the true birth and the birth out onto the other side of what's possible um, from these experiences um, and uh, give them the possibility to come to fruition. Thanks. In addition to everything that's been said so far, I'd like to add that a spiritual crisis involves an individual person having a massive shift in awareness of their their environment and the cosmos, and having getting like having started from one particular worldview. Uh, like an understanding of themselves as a component in the universe, as an individual person, um, and having an understanding of three-dimensional reality and time and space and having perhaps a limited understanding of spirituality, spirit realm, uh, or possibilities of connection with, um, with others. Then having something happen with, which basically dumps them or downloads into their awareness so much new data, so much new information, perspectives that make the old worldview impossible to believe anymore. And then they have to somehow expand um, their, their entire understanding of the universe and themselves and this and uh, spirituality in order to contain and and uh, integrate this new information this new data you could say uh and then and then so then they have to like re uh remap out the whole universe around them and um and perhaps um you know for example they might go from never believing in in life after death to believing in an afterworld or even reincarnation or something like that or uh you know never never believing uh in angels or demons or deities or and then suddenly just having something tangible that they cannot deny that then they have to incorporate and in order to incorporate that they have to remap out and they have to drop a massive thing that they're attached to, which is their belief system, drop that old belief system, uh, which is a you know it's a loss and it's a tragedy, and then reconstruct somehow um, a new entire worldview, and that is a crisis of meaning, a crisis of identity, a crisis of um, of place in the world, and um, crisis of knowledge and community and so on. There was a quote that I used in one of my presentations for spiritual emergence psychosis. I don't remember who it was by, so I'll paraphrase here, but um, it was when an individual being dazzled by truths that was just really hard to contain or integrate. Um, and when I think about spiritual crisis or um, spiritual emergencies, yeah, having an experience that really wakes us up, that shows us maybe a new way of being um, and just being dazzled by that truth and then having to come back and be like, how am I showing up in the world now, now that I know this? I can't turn it off. Um, and so that really creates this, um, you know, this kind of a confrontation with like, who am I? Um, and then how am I starting to, to show up? And I, I really like the term spiritual emergence. Um, Stan and Christina Groff uh, coined that term and just kind of like this play with this emergency that's happening within somebody, the psycho-spiritual kind of death and rebirth experience um, where everything that they knew 
they thought they knew is now crumbling, but it's also this opportunity to emerge out of this crisis into a higher level of functioning or higher level of consciousness. Um, and when I really think about that, I think about the concept of initiation, um, of having these experiences uh, happen to us that really make us uh, sometimes step into a new path and a new role and um, not really under not having a cultural framework that understands that I think that can really create more of a crisis if anything I remember um, a teacher of mine when I shared my experience he just looked at me and he said you know it's it's a shame that you grew up in the culture that you grew up in if you grew up in a traditional culture the elders would have stepped in and taught you this new way of being and seeing the world and that hit me and said wow being in the world after a very profound experience. And it's all I was looking for, um, just somebody to help me navigate being in, in this world. So, and to some extent, it's like, how are, how are we starting to develop a relationship with the universe after that? Um, we'll end it there. Thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, furthering Kyle's point, um, I think that it's for me, um, crisis emerges because most of us do live um, in a society that has a very secular worldview that um, does not support these types of experiences. Um, so, for example, I'll use the example of meditation again um, because that's my research area, but um, people who meditate um, and who might be meditating in a secular um, Western environment often can have really profound experiences, so significant changes to their sense of self or insights into the nature of um, emptiness. And if there is uh, no supportive context or, or there's no teacher who really has that depth of understanding to help them through that experience, um, I believe that that's when it can turn into a crisis. Um, so I'm really interested as you know things like meditation and psychedelics do move into the secular clinical mainstream. Um, how a practitioner is going to deal with that and provide a supportive environment, um, you know, so that people don't move into crisis but can move through these experiences um, in a smoother way. Uh, I'm far from an expert on, on this on this topic, uh, and I think what I am about to say echoes with. Um, with everything that's been said here. And I think about the people I've known in my life who have had a drug induced psychosis, like a, like what from the outside appeared very clear to be a drug induced psych psychosis who needed to be hospitalized. And even I had one friend who ended up ending their life in the midst of what seemed to be a drug induced psychosis and how intense the ideas are about what's happening become and how obsessed people become about those ideas. And that those who I've known who have come through the other side of it, when I hear them tell me about what those ideas are, they don't actually seem all that psychotic to me. They actually seem coherent and related with other paradigms of for consciousness, time, reality, um, spirits. And I, I wonder about how much, how that experience led them to behave created a situation where the sort of the, the arm of like this, the psychiatric world got involved and ended up possibly, you know, treating something in a way that didn't necessarily need to be treated in that way, like drugs or, you know, isolation or, or whatever, like um, sedation and whatever else. Um, and so I, I just I just wonder about that, and I wonder what is the line, and how do we find the line between this person is in a spiritual crisis that needs spiritual support, and this person is having a psychotic episode and needs psychiatric medication and needs to be protected from from harming themselves, and um, and then I wonder if it's fair to say that a number of experiences coming out of profound psychedelic experiences might be well handled more with a spiritual emergence tactic than the sort of like default psychiatric tactic. How many other experiences of people being psych going into psychosis or having 
be ending up being diagnosed with schizophrenia or what have you is also not an issue of say what's wrong with their brain that needs to be fixed with a drug and is an issue of like a reality sense making thing and a different paradigm of understanding reality might help correct the course of what they're going through in a way that perhaps creates some sort of fuller coherence rather than spending the rest of your that person's life on a psychiatric medication to make sure that that process doesn't blossom again. Yeah. Um, for me, I was thinking about this story that I once heard about Moses um, after he had, you know, written the Ten Commandments and everything. And after he had done all of his work, he was chilling with God and God, and he was like, God, I, I want to see you. <laughs> I love you so much. I really want to see you. And God was like, honestly, if you see me, like you'll die. I'm so beautiful. Like you will die. <laughs> and Moses was like, no, please. I need it. And God was like, okay, I'll let you see my shadow. And when Moses saw his shadow, he went insane for 40 days out in the desert and he was like, and he became enlightened. And for me, for my spiritual emergence, it really felt like I had caught a whiff of the divine. And it, like all of you have mentioned, completely blew away every sort of thing that I had ever held in my mind as an identifier of who I was. Like, I guess that was my ego was destroyed in it. And then all of a sudden I was forced to identify with the fact that I was a part of this thing called God and so was everyone else. And so then it became about how do you become in right relationship with, with this omnipotent sense of spirit? Um, and that can really, that, that having that understanding um, just makes everything else seems so insignificant for, for a long time. Um, but it really, for me, it just became about knowing that these common things, including like your relationships with people are the most precious and the most spiritual thing we can do. It has nothing to do with like going to Costa Rica for a month and doing sound baths. Like true spirituality really is, is about love. Um, so for me, it was really a return to, to love, to compassion um, and to humility, knowing that whatever power was running through me and whatever power of creation I had was coming from spirit. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was really hard to come to terms with. Um, but it was also so blissful. Like it was almost, it was so difficult to hold because it's like orgasm and agony just constantly like flipping in and out of those two things. So, yeah, that's what it was like. Okay, we're now going to move into uh, round two of this conversation. Uh, and in this round, we will are able to talk openly. Um, there's no more structure. There's no more um, sequence that we need to follow. Anyone can speak at any time um, following the thread of wondering about this question. What does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? Uh, statements can come in, and they can be references to the to to things said earlier. They could be non sequiturs, um, and there's no rush either. Sometimes not saying anything at all is saying something, and no need to rush in to fill what radio industry might call dead space. There's no need to rush in to fill the pregnant void of silence. Um, if that is, if that is, um, what's coming up. Um, and so we are in round two. Oh, and, and pardon me. And this will go for about 45 or so minutes and I will be keeping the time. So no need to worry about that. I can start with a question. Um, I, and it's directed at the group, and I'm also particularly interested in Mudge's opinion on this, um, because often when we talk about spiritual crisis, we're thinking of, um, you know, an ecstatic, um, and to use the psychopathological term, sometimes psychotic visionary state that can be extended, but that then resolves. 
But what about people who have these ongoing, um, you know, cycles of crisis that last for years? So we've got, you know, St John of the Cross talks about the dark night of the soul. Um, and if you look at um, bipolar disorder, obviously there are, there are lots of elements that seem like a spiritual crisis, but um, for, for many people it doesn't ever seem to resolve. So I'd be really interested to hear, um, yeah, everyone's thoughts on that. I guess one of the first things that kind of pops into my mind when that question um, got posed was just um, in terms of like, say, integration work with psychedelics or plant medicines. And I just even think about my, some of my own experiences. It's an ongoing process. It's always changing and new things are, are always arising. Um, and I remember talking to uh, the teacher that I study with, who's a shamanic practitioner, hopefully trying to find some comfort in, in you know, the experiences that, that I was like going through. And he made a comment one time of just saying, you know, my life is Looney Tunes. There's always these ups and downs and things are coming in and, and this and that. And it's like, does it ever really resolve? Or um, as Dale mentioned, uh, you know, it's like, what is the right relationship? How do we develop a relationship with these processes? Um, and yeah. Well, I'd like to like question back whether or not it resolves is it's surely is it it's more of it is it really a problem anymore? Is that individual person suffering? Uh you know, in the case of people who are labeled schizophrenic, they often experience um you know hearing voices and those voices are really intimidating. So they they live in a lot of anxiety, uh, fear and confusion and difficulty in, in relating with like mainstream society. In the case of bipolar people, we, uh, we have, you know, I mean, being suicidal on a regular basis ain't fun and, um, being, um, Certainly the extremes of mania are also really problematic and really damaging to usually to ourselves and often to those around us. So those are problematic. Um, now I also want to bring back to James was questioning, you know, whether these things really need to be handled by hospitalization and psychiatric medication and stuff like that. Well, something that a lot of people are, are not are, we're not aware of is that the psychiatric drugs don't actually work very well. Like that's a gross generalization, but it's pretty true. I mean, certainly, although for like uni basic standard major depression disorder, i.e. unipolar simple depression, actually, yes, those there are some pills that work quite well for that. But for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, this um the pills they from an objective perspective, from the perspective of the psychiatrist, in terms of their tick, tick list of things of like, is this person in hospital? Are they, you know, um, have they committed, attempted suicide or have they, you know, gone bankrupt recently? You can, you, the pills can sort of take out the extremes. And so, um, generally I, I call them shut up and behave yourself pills because that's what they make you do. And they, from an objective perspective, they can, they can make someone look like they're behaving or look like the problems that they're causing the rest of the society are, have, have been uh, controlled, as in stopped. But does it actually, does it actually solve their individual subjective experience problems? And often they don't. Um, so even like, for example, the, the schizophrenia pills, uh, the antipsychotics, they don't actually even necessarily stop the hearing voices. And then they, they cause all sorts of other problems. Um, and, you know, bipolar disorder, you know, there's the, the, the antidepressants don't actually stop the depression or stop the mania that well. They just sort of, but, but what they do do very effectively is cut out all the beautiful stuff. So cut out, like uh, Dale was talking about this, you know, sometimes orgasmic 
uh, ecstatic sense of awareness of of the divine consciousness and so on. It, get, it certainly gets rid of that, and it gets rid of the, the psychiatric pills. Get rid of you know creativity and libido and um, and you know zest for life and exuberance and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's that. I'll just leave it there for the moment. Just reflect back to the group. I love um, what's been said so far, and I feel like um, also speaking maybe about the the body and the energy body um, and the intuitive nature uh, when when we're talking about um, what I call an energy modulation dysregulation, uh, like so-called bipolar. Um, so the the folks that I that I work with and myself as well, when um, when we've been labeled in, potentially in in that way, um, what we find is that um, as as things are opening up energetically, um, uh, when we think about the channel um, and we think of our bodies as modulators, um, for me, it's really helpful to understand that these these peaks and valleys, the ecstatic and the devastating, um, are it's these these intense energies that are moving through. And like, how do we um, how do we work with it? How do we dance with it? How do we move with it in a way that allows us to go as closest possible to that without going over whatever that line is for each of us, um, and and ride those edges. You know, and I call it the ultraviolet path because it is, it's very, um, it's very challenging to, to, to work with it and to work with it well and safely. Um, and, and it's also extremely like, um, for me, very empowering and freeing to be able to acknowledge that, um, those, those, the bandwidth of access to, to these, these places is available. And with now more consent than before, um, on a soul level and in, a, in, a, in, in this realm sense, um, to be able to be able to navigate those those places and not feel victimized by them. Um, so a lot of the work that I do and, and why I think my my sub niche is psychic opening is because a lot of the folks that that are either voice hearers um, or receive these massive downloads and get completely dysregulated in the nervous system. When we find that we work with the trauma, we work with grounding, we work with navigation of the psychic gifts, we find that the thing that was labeled um, as bipolar uh, resolves itself. Um, and, um, and I do believe that, um, and for the folks that have been labeled schizophrenic, um, they start to, um, clear the field, um, and be able to have discernment of who that is that's speaking, um, and be able to, to ally with, um, with beings that are and entities and, and forces and energies that are in service to, um, their personal mission, um, and to be able to, um, have discernment and, um, clarity, uh, to not have those, those voices that are, that are harmful. Um, so it, it, to me, it's about, um, energy sovereignty, um, and it's about, uh, empowerment of those psychic gifts. Thank you. This is such a delightful conversation. <laughs> James, thank you. Ah, oh, so much. Um, I guess I'm bouncing ideas off so many things that have been said. One piece I'd like to insert into the conversation is the importance of social context. Um, you know, yes, there's the individual who has the journey, of course, and all the pieces that we've addressed within that. But we're living in a time right now on this planet that simply does not understand nor have any compassion for such experiences and it wasn't always the way you know as Kyle had mentioned um, that a mentor had said to him there was a time and a place in certain communities and societies where this was understood this had a role it had a place and so you had an emergence a crisis an emergency that's all common uh, sorry that's all modern language that we put on an experience um, because we today have no idea what this thing is that happens to these people. And so we throw medication at it, we throw labels at it, we outcast them from society, we distance loved ones and family members because we no longer understand them. This is all cultural context. And so one of the large pieces that really needs to be addressed, and my belief is this will happen through the people having the experience, is to slowly correct that 
in society. And that's not going to happen overnight. That's not easy because we're living in a paradigm. Um, and so how does one shift through a paradigm? How does one break it or correct it? I mean, that's that's a very big um, effort to make, but we must acknowledge that this time is not easy for people who are having these experiences. And the only reason we have to use language like a crisis and emergency is because the experience that is coming through is not being met by a conducive container or people or holding space. And I also wanted to um, address this idea. I, I, Dale, I love what you said there about orgasm and agony. What a, I've, I've heard it said different ways, but that's just such a, a lovely one. Maslow talked about peak states. And what happened in the last year of Maslow's life that many people don't know about is, of course, we all know about his hierarchy and the big pyramid that you supposedly have to climb these, these levels up to be a whole and healthy and sound person. But what he himself realised in the last year of his life when he had a near-death experience by heart attack was that there was another way of being, which he then came to call the plateau state. And so part of this... Um, ongoing cycle of integration, the orgasm, the agony, the peak and trough, you know, this can be an ongoing cycle that can happen, particularly when we get a taste of the peak, the orgasm, and we just want to stay in an orgasmic state. And we all know as human physical beings, it's, it's physically impossible to stay within an orgasmic state. As wonderful as an orgasm is, there comes a point where one must rest from that. We, we would explode and die if we stayed in that state. We're not built for it, but we are built to experience it. So after we have that, what then happens? And so this is where this beautiful term about the plateau can come into being, where it acknowledges that there can be the peaks and troughs, but there can also be a very smooth, flat place where all of that integration, the happy plateau can happen. It can bring along the richnesses of the experiences um, without denying that the peaks and the troughs can still occur. And so I find that a very useful metaphor in, in walking forth and navigating the continual bits and pieces that come along whilst attempting to kind of have a steady life as well. Um, for me, whenever I went through my spiritual emergency, um, I actually met a Native American Jungian psychologist who was um, very well versed in these kinds of things. And he started training me shamanically, um, which was just super helpful um, for me to start to understand. So uh, I'm biracial. My father is from South Africa. My mother is German and I live in Canada. And so he was really um, encouraging me to connect with my ancestral lineage because there's so much shamanism in that lineage. And what I discovered was that my people have been working with spirits in their bodies even. Um, and so when I was hearing all these voices to be able to connect with like, Oh, the, these are the voices of my ancestors, or they might be the voices of a larger ancestor, such as like one of the elements like water or fire or air might be um, speaking through you. So that was really helpful for me to kind of ground all of this like transcendent energy into the real world. Um, and another thing that I learned in Zulu shamanism is that if you are called in this spiritual crisis way into your ancestral lineages, if you deny that call, you will continue to have crises until you answer it. But it's such a difficult thing to accept in yourself because all of a sudden your life is no longer yours. You're living with your ancestors inside your body. Um, and a lot of people will avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. But seriously, if you don't do it, you can't make any money. Uh, relationships don't work. Think, like car accidents, like all of this stuff that is just like, hey, the spirit's just saying we're right here. And like, we need you to play this role in life right now, especially right now, because we're in this climate crisis. We're in the pandemic crisis, we're in racial crises, all of these crises. Um, and we've 
the human race has gone through climate crises before in like 5,000 year cycles. And it has been people who have lived close to the relationship, close to earth and in harmony with earth and having sustainable practices that have lived through these major climate changes. So I feel like not like psychedelics are having these renaissance are having a renaissance, but also so many women of the African diaspora of native American descent um, are being called to shamanism so that we can start to reclaim these earth practices that are literally speaking through us so that we can make it through what's going to happen next. Uh, what I, what I want to say is, is, it's kind of a follow-up to what Dale had said in her introductory introductory um, statement and something Nicole had said about cultural context and then something Anna had said about um, about the concern for how, if I remember correctly, about how we as a society are going to help people who are having really big experiences once we start giving a lot of people psychedelics. Um, and... I, I think about um, uh, a man who I hold in my life as being a, a teacher, Stephen Jenkinson. He talks about, uh, he talks about, <laughs> Dale, I see your response. It's nice. Um, about the world tree. He talks about the sort of the, the myth or the legend of the world tree and that it's sort of misunderstood as being the thing that connects the different levels. But actually, it was a thing that protected us. From those levels and we cared for it so that the higher the deities the gods they didn't come flooding into our lives and that we did ceremony to keep it strong and we did ceremony to travel it but we also wanted to make sure that it stayed nice and strong so things didn't blend um and that it has become withered now that's his premise that the world the world tree withered and uh and i and i think about Dale, something Dale had said made me think of the, oh, the story of Moses, made me think about the, um, the I think Kevin Smith movie, uh, Dogma, Jay and Silent Bob, and at some point, you know, God shows up at the end, and God is Alanis Morissette, of course, because um, it was like the late nineties, uh, and ish, maybe later, anyways. And then um, one of the angels, you know, like bears themselves. I'm ruining the movie for everyone. Spoiler alert. Um, and, and says, and, and like, here's the voice of God. At which point his head promptly explodes. Um, and I, all that being said, I, I wonder about what's going to happen. And, and I wonder about what my role is, what our role is, and possibly even what the role of this, this podcast now is in helping to have a nice cultural context already grown, the sort of like the mycelial webs already reached out. Because if, if, and hopefully it doesn't get to this point, if psilocybin ceremonies or psilocybin therapies or other big psychedelic therapies are being administered by people who only need to get a weekend certification who have never actually had psychedelics in their life, you know, and then they start giving them to people who don't have any context for this at all. You know, where are they going to go to make sense of their big experience? There's the possibility that those experiences that really push us to the boundary will start to dissolve away because everyone will be giving very managed dose and very managed secular context. I don't necessarily think that's going to serve us as a whole, although it might help treat people's symptomatic issues of depression so they could go back to work. But I question about like, what is what is our role now is I'm not giving an answer. I question what is our role now in ensuring that those cultural spaces and places are coherent and ready for those people so that they don't fall through the cracks and just become a, you know, a, a casualty of the soon to be exploding psychedelic therapy industry. It's a great question. And um, it's definitely something Joe and I have been bringing up on a lot of our podcasts with like the capitalization within the psychedelic world. And, you know, this is something I've really been thinking about, like, <clears throat> even though the, like these, these powerful techniques are starting to become more accessible, do we have a cultural framework that will support that um, or societal framework where 
psychiatry can understand this, right? I mean, if it's happening in a medical setting, what are they going to do when people start having these big opening experiences? Can we contain that? I just think about, yeah, my whole experience with like a near death experience wasn't even psychedelic related, it just happened naturally from a snowboarding accident, but not being in a container that that could hold that from, you know, from you know, just that philosophical perspective, it was really challenging to navigate it. And so, you know, that's definitely one of my worries as this starts to scale, as more centers start to grow. I mean, I I guess we're kind of even seeing a little, a little bit of it with a lot of the ketamine centers popping up um, and a lot of IV clinics just coming in and not doing any sort of prep and integration work. Um, And yeah, how are we going to catch everybody? And that's been a, a really big question of mine. Where, Where's the landing pad? Where, where's the, the safety net for a lot of people? Um, and just thinking about like treatment options, like my, my time at this, uh, this residential treatment uh, facility um, was really interesting because it was peer support based. Um, and it was a place where people could come for three to six months wasn't covered by insurance. Uh, the, the state of Vermont actually paid for it. And they're just allowed to be there through their experience. Um, and it was it was really special to watch people move through some of their quote unquote psychosis. Some people had medication um, and some people didn't. But just having that space of people to be with them and feel supported, um, it was just so magical. And, you know, there was a lot of education, I think, that needed to be done within the community because, you know, the hospitals and the regular mental health industry was like, wait, what are you doing? You're staffing a house full of peer support people and you're trying to help people with psychosis and schizophrenia. That's dangerous, right? You need to medicate them. And um, I forget who mentioned it about medication, but it just popped in my head. I don't know if it was Robert Whitaker or somebody else, but I mean, when they first started to develop those antipsychotics, I mean, they labeled them as chemical straitjackets. So it was a way to like, you know, restrict movement and and behavior um, through chemical means. And so, um, yeah, I I don't know. I got a lot of thoughts uh, buzzing around my head right now. It's an exciting topic. I could probably talk forever about it, but um, yeah, like what could treatment look like? Like what type of um, systems can we start to create? So when these, when this does happen, we're not having a bunch of casualties and just letting people hang to try to figure it out by themselves. Um, And I think the most, the hardest part about all of that, um, since I've been doing a lot of thinking about this over the years is just how, how do these projects get funded? I mean, we were really lucky that the state of Vermont funded it, but that wasn't forever. Like, you know, I was only there for about a year. I'm not really too sure how their funding works. I I did check in with a staff member a few months ago, and it sounded like they did get a cut in their their, uh, state funding. But, you know, if insurance isn't going to cover a lot of these alternative, you know, modalities or treatment centers, you know, do we need to start to kind of go community grassroots? Um, and really rely on peer support at times. And you know, that really starts to change the narrative around mental health training um, and who, who is qualified to offer mental health support for people going through very extreme crises. Um, toss that out there to the group. Just quickly oh, jump. Oh, sorry, no, you go, I, I was just going to quickly jump in and comment on what Kyle had said there and on just... This, the spark of hope that came up about the idea of a well-educated community of peers supporting each other and community and connection being built rather than it being a helpful, but sometimes not as helpful as it could be, sort of a power dynamic of the therapist and the patient. I was just going to um, jump off on Kyle's point around narratives, and that's something I'm really interested in in my own research is alternative discourses around what psychedelics are. So at the moment, we're seeing the clinical discourse come to be the dominant model. And, you know, a lot of the conversation is around clinical biomedical treatments or, you know, mainstream psychological treatments. But I think it's really important to um, keep a diverse conversation happening about, you know, other perspectives. So um, I recently wrote a paper, which is in review at the moment, on psilocybin mushroom churches, which are, you know, popping up in the United States. And, um, you know, I think it's really important to consider the different ways that people make sense of these experiences. And often they involve concepts such as the sacred, 
Um, and these are things that, you know, psychiatry and biomedicine just don't, um, you know, being secular paradigms, they just don't deal with these things. Um, so I think it's really important to have a diversity of voices and a diversity of narratives um, and to kind of keep, you know, a really rich ecosystem um, in the psychedelic space and not have it go just down the clinical path. Can I, um, can I respond? Thanks, Taylor. Uh, just following on from both Anna and Kyle's point. So I agree that psychiatry is, the ontology of psychiatry is actually anti-theistic uh, to the extent where speaking about angels, demons, the spirit realm, and so on are very often Diagnostic criteria for locking someone up in a, in a, in a, you know, an insane asylum, basically. So it's, it's defining, it's, it's fundamentally invalidating the subjective experience of the person who is going through that state, whether it's, uh, you know, in an enlightened manic state or whether it's a psychotic state or a spiritual emergent state or whatever it is. All of those states are, are defined as insane, as in not fitting into the valid, um, realistic uh, ontology of Western science. And, you know, therefore there's something pathological about them. Therefore they need to be uh, medicated, i.e. drug um, erased. Um, and that all, all these things... That, Validation, as anyone who's done psychology, validation of the subjective experience of whatever someone's going through is like totally fundamental to the therapeutic benefit of any kind of psychotherapy, right? So invalidating someone's subjective experience is going to mess with their head even worse. So it's actually doing a lot of harm. And, uh, Kyle's example of a peer support model one of the mechanisms of why that was so beneficial was that there is people there that's, that are saying okay i understand roughly i understand what you're going through and i acknowledge that as valid and actually you know i went through something like that a few years ago and actually i think you're real i think what you're experiencing is there is some reality in it and um and and and, and that in itself is therapeutic and this all leads on to, yes, I think the idea of peer support is a great one. I have a vision for a bipolar community church where bipolar people get together and support ourselves through these states um, and, and it just basically bypass the entire psychiatric system. Um, and, uh, and, yes, peer integration community there's a massive community of people who don't have these necessary these extreme so-called mental illnesses but they have experience in trauma and healing that and with the use of psychedelics and so yes there could be community integration of uh these experiences through peer support and i think that's a great idea I was just going to say there's, I feel like there's a huge opportunity for decolonization when uh, it, for the conversation about psychedelics, um, especially because, you know, colonizers colonized three quarters of the world and literally made it illegal for any kind of traditional healing practice. Um, they, they made it illegal. They burned witches at the stake. Um, you know, the, it's, it's horrifying. And then now we have this society that is suffering from so much mental illness because we have absolutely no soul in our society. And then we have this like colonial system that is distributing shamanic medicines, but these, but it's not being led by indigenous peoples and it's also not being informed by their lifestyles. And I think that was one of the huge, um, learning things that I went through with ayahuasca was, Originally, only the shaman would drink ayahuasca. They would never give it to other people. Only someone who had all of the training to use that medicine would ingest it. And also you needed that infrastructure of your tribe in order to hold the energy that that medicine 
is going to just start rushing through you and through your relationships. So I think it's so important to look at the traditional uses and to talk to indigenous peoples who are from the land that those medicines are coming from and, and letting the land speak um, is so important. And also just starting to validate um, these ancestral traditional ways of healing. And, and I think so many of us have been saying that about the diverse um, ecosystem that we need for this conversation. I would just like to add to what Dale had said there, that in the midst of everything that, that, uh, that Dale was talking about, these companies also aren't giving back they're ultimately having pirated these molecules. It's bio piracy. You know, there's all these psilocybin companies aren't giving anything to the Mazatec people who are the very reason why there was a tradition to discover back in the 50s by Mr. Wasson, who complicated guy. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a few companies that are doing that, but for the most part, it is it's biopiracy and it's colonialism and it's it's uh, it is extracting resources and then profiting off them without giving back to the lands and the people um, from which those resources have been extracted. And what's so important is that this is we're talking about relationships. Ultimately, using plant medicine is about your relationship with that plant, and that plant is going to know that you are taking it. And you are not giving back back to its people, and I think that's where West the Western mind really doesn't understand just how subtle these things work. Because I think what you know we're trying to oh sorry, I'll be really quick. Um, just that idea about relationship. I, I'm just seeing at the moment with psychedelics, you know, a lot of focus on ego dissolution as the peak psychedelic experience. Um, but in my own research with participants who've gone through a truffle retreat in the Netherlands, um, there's all sorts of rich, incredible experiences that emerge. And one in particular I'm so interested in is shape-shifting. So often my participants turn into another person, an animal, um, and they experience life from their perspective. And I think, you know, this is something that um, I'm really passionate about in terms of qualitative research is really looking at what people are experiencing and, and what's going on and not being too quick to kind of, you know, to, to create a trope, to create something that sounds really good in the media, like, oh, it's about ego dissolution and your default mode network goes offline, you know, and then your issue is resolved. Um, so I'm 100% with Dale. I think that one of the, you know, the amazing things about these compounds is their ability to highlight the interconnectivity of things and the relationships that we have with the world around us. I wanted to piggyback off something that uh, Dale mentioned, uh, just around the shaman shrinking, and then also how they have these subtle impacts or influences. I remember I was chatting with uh, somebody that did some studying with the tribe. I forget where, I don't know if it was in Peru or Brazil. But it was a really interesting comment that uh, this person made and said, you know, the tribe that I study with, they wouldn't drink all the time because it had kind of consequences to the community. Um, and every time you went in there, you could bring something back, whether that was like a spiritual entity or just any sort of energy, and that would have ripple effects. And it makes me think about, you know, I guess like more of these philosophical questions when it comes to psychedelics. What are we interacting with? Um, and do we really understand from our Western perspective and science, these transpersonal phenomenon? Like, what are we interacting with? And uh, like, when she said that, I was like, I'm so thankful, like you mentioned that, because I get that sense too. Like every time I go into that space, I go, there's something really interesting here. And there have been ripple effects that have played out in my life after going in there. It's a very sacred thing where I'm not like, you know, you don't do this all the time. You go in there where you really need something. Um, so I just wanted to toss that out there to follow up with Dale. I think that's such an important point. What are we messing with? <laughs> do we really know? Do we really understand? And we're on a planet right now that is suffering from a crisis of meaning. I mean, there are so many people wandering around. We go through this schooling education system and 
carry on life with this idea of what life is supposed to look like. And the vast majority of people carry that out. You, you know, go through your schooling, you find a career that's meant to be fulfilling in some way. You tick all of the boxes, essentially, of what, you know, is a purposeful life. And then you get to a point and go, but surely there must be more than this. And there's that many people on the planet right now that have been asking that exact question. There must be more than this. I feel hollow. I feel empty in my life. And so we look to things and that is being met uh, along with all kinds of substances that people are going towards, you know, and not just substances, but relationships and toxicities and all kinds of doorways that people can go to to find meaning. In addition to that, We have a spiritual candy store right now, a global spiritual candy store where we have never had more access to different modalities, different tools, different techniques, processes from secret schools that have been held in, as Kyle mentioned, in in the world tree, you know, to protect in many ways because once doorways are opened, there need to be um, wholesome, safe, grounded holding spaces for such experiences. So this is in itself a crisis that is happening on the planet right now, a crisis of of psyche, of spirit, where great openings and great opportunities are there and yet at the same time um, so is the, 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 uh, the need to meet it in a healthy, wholesome way. And perhaps that's exactly what needs to be happening. Perhaps we need to be sitting in the messy discomfort of all of this right now as a collective in order to grow up a little bit and care about one another a bit more and care about this planet that is home to us and giving us and sustaining us life that we are treating so pathetically at this point in time. Maybe this is just the the, the kick up the bum that we need. I feel like thank you so much for 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 sharing that and I feel like they're part of the reason that that we're going into these experiences is because of the great need of this time for people who are connected for people who are um who are who are seeing what's really going on and I remember um James mentioned like what's the unspoken and listen for the unspoken and Something's arising around that, which is that's for me, like when I'm when I'm in the experience or when I'm working with folks in the experience, they're carriers of the unspoken, they're carriers of something that needs to be said. And of course, the system is threatened by that because change is so needed, it's so necessary right now because of the the multiple interlocking oppressive systems that try to tamp down the truth and the power of the individual's capacity to connect to the earth, to our bodies, to spirituality, and, and that line, that direct line that we can be as conduits for the divine in matter. Not, not to transcend and leave and go somewhere else, but to bring spirit back in. Because that this time we have been disconnected, you know, through Western rational materialism, patriarchy, capitalism, et cetera, that there are these are separating, separating, separating. And so now it's like we're we're coming back together. We're bringing bringing ourselves back together from this dismemberment. we're 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 being we're re- remembering, and we're doing it together, and we're learning how to do that in community again. Um, so thank you. And uh, I think something else is worth acknowledging is that in so many, uh, so many people's spiritual crises, um, and in so many people's manic depressive mood swings and mental health crises as well, there's an energetic trigger, uh, which is an unspoken, I'm, I'm responding to Michelle's what is unspoken well unfortunately there is a lot of sexual abuse that is going unspoken in our society um 
there's still a pandemic of of uh, sexual abuse and sexual violence, you know, with approximately one in three women going through that, um, you know, being victims of that situation for, with no responsibility of their own. And it's, um, and it's a tragedy, but somehow in this Western, rational, patriarchal culture that we're living in, that is the perpetrators are not taking responsibility and the culture as a whole is not taking responsibility and the you know the the fact is the majority of the perpetrators are male and the males as a whole are not collectively taking responsibility for addressing this pandemic and um and so it's that trauma is invalidated often when it's spoken by by children, uh, for example, or by by adults, for that matter, and that is um, it's invalidated. And what happens to an invalidated experience is that it gets repressed in the um, in the unconscious and in the body, and acts as a as a energetic charge in the neurophysiology of of someone of a, of a human being and that um and that often festers and becomes uh a trigger for a crisis as well and so this needs to be addressed and of course there's a lot a lot of people ha have these things buried and then when they take a psychedelic substance um whether it's in a therapy or in a festival then they have this remembrance and that is something that um is that is huge for those people and, and deserves to be um to be supported and the original um abuse deserves to be acknowledged yeah absolutely and i think that there needs to be a recognition as a culture that you know being traumatized by what is happening in the world like being devastated um that is not that does not mean you're overly sensitive or mentally ill i just think it's such a normal response and i think back to when i've been in you know quite severe clinical depressions in the past and you know one of the things that i experienced was i was just unable to read the news because anytime i read a story about a woman or any person or an animal being abused, it would just ruin me. It would just destroy me. And I remember um, someone saying to me, like, oh, yes, that's not normal. Like, you know, you need to go on medication. Um, and I just think maybe that is normal. Maybe that is a normal response to these horrible things. And, and maybe a lot of the time, you know, what I thought is normal is actually being quite numbed out. Um, so... Yeah, I'm thinking of a of a, a like a political cartoon thing that I saw uh, where it was like a, a koala grasping a tree, and all the trees around it were just very clearly cut down. It was like a clear cut, and it was just one koala grasping to this last tree, and it was like clearly distressed. And there were two people there, and one of them was like. Uh, oh, this koala seems to be depressed. I think it needs psychiatric medication. Um, and that links in with a with a wondering I had earlier and also kind of goes back to the trauma thing because Michelle had mentioned how much trauma work was a part of working through spiritual crisis, which is, I guess it's two thoughts I have. One thought is like, what is it that we can do day to day Oh, there's this is it's a, such a weird question because it's like a how do we solve what's happening in us? But then it's hard. Like, how do we do that? Well, the outside world is still totally falling apart and so toxic. Um, but it's like, what is it that we could be doing day to day that supports our system in order to hold this energy? Um, as as Michelle, the language that you had been using, um, and then the other wondering I have is 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 any 
psychiatric, psychiatric mental health issue, you know, when we say spiritual crisis, I think, oh yeah, you know, you're grappling with the presence of God or encounters with entities or experiencing perpetual timelessness or something. But our moments of being profoundly overwhelmed by traumatic events coming up into your life, is that as much of a spiritual crisis as is trying to figure out how to live in a life now that you know that you are a refraction of a total timeless entity um, and how much trauma weighs in it. These aren't clear, conclusive things. They're just two areas that I, I find myself wondering about in the last 10 or so minutes. Um, I listened to this, um, I can't remember his name, this author, but he was talking about how trauma is sort of the entry point for spirituality and how it can be alchemized in a certain way in order to produce that kind of surrender. I don't have an answer to this question, but I am also wondering um, what that could mean. Um, He also talked a lot about like sort of the journey of Christ as the archetypal journey of each soul and the necessity of the crucifixion in order for him to ascend. And I, I, I wonder that often if, if we have these traumatic experiences in order to bring us to things like prayer. I think the question about how do we ground these experiences is a really important one. Um, it's It can be easy in these conversations and these experiences to get lost in the experience <clears throat> and the content and by the bright sparkly things. Uh, and, um, you know, what we know from many of the great sages and from the pathways, um, the wisdom paths that are there is that the goal at the end of the day is about being a very ordinary human being. (laughs) It's about loving one another. It's about, you know, living with our neighbours and our families. Um, And I I think for anyone listening to this conversation who might be going through such experiences or really questioning what do I do with all of this stuff that is happening, um, one of the simplest things is to simply be in whatever your state of optimum well-being is, you know, and well-being meaning what keeps us happy and comfortable. And it can be as basic as a warm, safe space and warm, safe people and warm, nourishing foods and good sleep. You know, just some really fundamental basics like that can go a very long way in giving fertile, healthy soil to the tree that we are, regardless of our experiences that occur. And I think we need to raise the bar when it comes to having conversations about spiritual and religious issues. So um, I feel like at the moment, most people, um, you know, or most people in a secular society think about religion and they think of extremes like, um, you know, religious fundamentalists or they think of spirituality and they think of, you know, the new age or conspiracy theories. Um, But it's quite amazing to think that even though we live in a secular society, something like 85% of people in the world actually adhere to some sort of faith tradition. So it's like this is the majority of people we're talking about and I think that we don't have Um, a very sophisticated language um, currently in in the West to talk about these issues, and this has to change. So up until now, I think that in psychiatry and psychology, you know, these spiritual issues have been dismissed as being psychopathology or they've just been ignored and, like, this is not our domain. Um, And I really think that has to change. Yeah, I tend to agree. And coming back to, I think, something, Dale, you said about um, a soulless world, soul not in, no soul in society, and somebody else brought it up, um, just about psyche in general. <clears throat> Makes me think of James Hillman um, and kind of his critique on uh, bringing psyche back into psychology, so bringing soul back into psychology. And it's really where we lack at times. Psychiatry and psychology has really moved away from its philosophical origins that we don't talk about much. 
Um, and, you know, how do we bridge the gap there? Um, my teacher, Lenny, ended up doing a philosophy PhD and found out that there wasn't enough psychology and philosophy. And so he decided to do a PhD in clinical psychology and then came to the conclusion that there wasn't enough philosophy in psychology and wasn't pleased with both areas. Um, how do we bridge those two together? Uh, my mind came up with an immediate answer to what Kyle just said, which was like, spiritual crisis is the thing that's going to bring those things together, learning how to address and assess those things, because it seems like both are required. You know, there's the requirement of dealing psychotherapeutically with trauma. And then there's also the requirement of holding that in a larger context of being than just the individual self's psychological responses to experience in life. Um, and another thing that I thought about earlier around being grounded and being well, and then also how messed up the world is, is a question which is like, and why people are depressed in this soulless land and this, this many, many crises all at once right now is should we be trying to feel better? I mean, obviously it's not really helping anyone if we none of us can get out of bed and we're just like, you know, sure. Um, but is wellness really a good goal right now? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I asked that as if it weren't, and it was, a, it was actually a, an accusation or a statement veiled as an inquiry. So I'm sorry if that was the case, but it is, it is, it is, feels like a real inquiry. Like, should we, like, should I be trying to solve my depression right now? in the sense that seeking to make it go away so I could feel better. You know, I, I'm not particularly depressed right now, but when I am, like, I, I wonder about that. Of course, I don't want to feel this way anymore, but should I be trying to feel better? Is that the goal? Keep taking Soma as the world's crumbling. Yeah, I think there's a recognition um you know, people who do this type of deep inquiry um, with things like depression, that it's, um, you know, of, of course you do not want to be clinically depressed. That is helpful for no one. But there is also this element of, you know, you, you quickly realise that you as an individual can't be a happy, functioning person when society around you is crumbling. Like it's just not possible. And so I think that... Um, you know, what you're talking about, James, it's like to what end are we trying to get better? Maybe, you know, a mature response is to get better so that we can then, you know, help others and change the system, hopefully. One of the things that came up for me is um, the idea of self-care uh, is, is really not an Indigenous idea. And a lot of the times we're telling people self-care or, or your own wellness when really what they need is community care. And a lot of us don't know why we're anxious or depressed, um, but what we have is our, our broken families or bad uh, friendships that, that, that aren't true bonds. Um, maybe we aren't living our purpose and, and we aren't sowing our life in into um, our own genius. That can be these like existential sort of depressions. Um, and I think learning more about the soul and understanding that we need these connections with tribe, with community, with with young people. We need mentors. We need elders. James, like we were talking about Stephen Jenkinson, just how um, how much we need elders. And yet our society just ships them off to these facilities to live in. Um, and they're not getting what they need from society and we're not getting their gifts either. Um, so I think understanding just how, how interconnected we are and just how much our mental health is based on those strong connections um, is so important to start recognizing so that we aren't telling someone who, who has depression that, oh, they need some self-care and you need to go to, in deep in inquiry when really they, they, they need to heal their family relations or even their ancestral lineage. Um, all of these things can be unearthed, especially when you're using shamanic medicines like mushrooms and, and ayahuasca. They'll bring all of that stuff forward um, for you to start looking at, which, again, you're going to need a community in order to hold that kind of work. I'm just going to step in here as facilitator. We're going to close round two. 
Um, but let's all just maybe take a breath for a second and let things settle. Okay, in our closing round, we're going to go through and each person will get an opportunity to share one clear, coherent, concluding thought on the question, what does it mean to have a spiritual crisis? And uh, we'll go in the same order we started. Uh, well, actually, we'll go in a different order now because the people on the screen have changed. Um, so we'll go uh, Anna, Kyle, Michelle, Nicole, Benjamin, Dale, and then myself. And of course, you can pass um, if you're not ready when your turn comes up. So, Anna. Okay, a, a final thought. Um, I think from, from this discussion, it's clear that one of the things we have to consider is that um, maybe a spiritual crisis is you know, quite a normal response to this current system that we're living in um, and that the secularization and the commodification of spiritual practices um, may result in us, um, you know, as a society, having people experience more of these crises. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that, um, you know, this is not... Um, just about the individual, but we need to start thinking about this on a, a social and cultural level. Oh man, I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. Um, <clears throat> there was something that came up about the spiritual crisis and, and just thinking about it being a very kind of individual crisis. And I, I really like that the discussion seemed to be leaning towards uh, this more kind of communal crisis. Uh, it always comes back to this uh, phrase I heard, I think coming from like shamanic traditions, like when the community is sick, the individual is sick, when the individual is sick, the community is sick. And so how do we really see a lot of these crises as um, aspects of community? And I, I think about uh, the book by, um, Arnold Mendel, City Shadow, and just talking about people uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia and, and uh, these disorders being the shadow of the city, um, of the aspects that the shitty, the, the, the shitty, <laughs> the city uh, can't integrate. Yeah, Floridian slip there, I guess, shitty city. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that shadow aspect that we've kind of pushed out um, and people have a hard time then reintegrating. How do we accept people back in and learn how to, um, you know, maybe find that there's gifts in, in these types of experiences and a role to be played. Like when I think about um, some shamanic traditions, people that are going through those initiatory crises or have those big types of experiences, there's usually a role for them to play. Um, and yeah, and I think on a cautionary note that I wanted to end with, I wanted to bring up, um, sorry, it's not clear and cohesive straight line, but um, the idea of romanticizing spiritual crises. Um, I had a teacher share a story one time about um, somebody go going on a safari and they entered a village and this uh, person came up to the vehicle and they're acting all erratic and, and somebody um, was like, oh, that must be the village shaman. And uh, the villager came over and said, uh, oh, no, he's just crazy. And I hope that that term crazy doesn't offend anybody. But it's just to state that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, people do find themselves in extreme states and just uh, that not to always emphasize and romanticize spiritual experiences, that there might be something actually going on. Um, and I'll give a plug to, to James's podcast, uh, What Happened to Tobias. I mean, that podcast really, really hit a chord with me. I remember listening to it and just feeling so emotional and thinking about maybe the cons of being in community and maybe, uh, especially in those medicine communities, just thinking, oh, take more medicine, take more medicine, and not realizing that there may be an actual problem there to actually seek support. So, you know, if you are going through something really intense, it's okay to seek support sometimes. Um, you know, people that were in the place that I worked, 
they, they had medication just to get their sleep in check and they really needed that. And so, you know, not to be afraid to, to find and, and seek support um, if you are going through something really intense and um, don't really know how to make sense of it. So I'll end there. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it's been such an honor to, to be in, in Sacred Circle with everyone today. Um, just reminding myself and maybe those out there who are listening that have gone through something that you're not alone and that we're all trying to work together to create something new. And, you know, for me, I, I think about cognitive liberty um, when we're talking about psychedelics, but also when we're talking about um, uh, mental health, that we have the opportunity to, um, to work with our consciousness in whatever way we choose. And also we have the right to not have uh, an infliction upon us, whether it's some other reality telling us what's true for us or medication or whatever, but that actually like working on um, getting support around consent and whether we're talking about the unspoken of the, the lack of consent um, in, in other areas or the lack of consent in terms of the way that our minds and bodies are, are, are treated. And to echo Artie Lang, like treatment is how we treat one another. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me on here and thank you for everything that's been shared. It's been so deep and powerful to be together. Yeah, this truly has been a powerful gathering. Thank you um, for making it happen uh, and for everyone being present. Echoing Michelle, the final thought that is just sitting with me to share is, you know, it's okay if you're not okay <laughs> and you are not alone. You know, we are all on this great, strange human adventure together and we're all figuring it out and bumbling our way through this ever emergent experience together in this ongoing eternal present moment and everyone has a little answer to give in that and a little wisdom but no one's got it all and we therefore need each other you know and um <clears throat> We are in it, whether we acknowledge that we're in it together or not. Um, it's happening together because simply by the fact that we're present on this planet right now. Um, so it's a beautiful thing when we can come together openly, curiously, non-judgmentally, compassionately to simply share experiences and wisdoms. And in all of that, um, it's helpful. It's helpful to be able to live and move through life. And thank you for the sharing. It's such a pleasure to connect with all of you and, and hear what you bring. Yeah, thanks, everyone. It's been a real honor to be part of this brainstorm. Thank you, James, for inviting me. So a spiritual crisis in reflection of what everyone's been saying, the the succinct thing for me is sounds like a crisis of spirit is a is an opportunity an amazing opportunity in the moment for a whole bunch of possible outcomes and evolutions so a crisis of uh, an, an, an evolution of awareness an evolution of uh, building bridges with community of reaching out and trying new healing modalities, possibly reaching out and trying psychedelics, an opportunity to heal one's ancestors, to heal our genetic uh, makeup that comes from our ancestors, an opportunity to understand our own pain as uh, contextualized in, a, in, in our family systems, in, in, in culture in general, and as us as beings uh, of Mother, born of Mother Earth, and that understanding the, the, you know, the environmental crisis that's going on now. And um, yeah, an opportunity for change in, in all of these ways. I just have the image of the coyote in my mind and I'm just reminded about the trickster energy of spirit 
and how we can look at these crises as going insane, but really it feels like you are coming to sanity in its deepest and most transcendent form. That's what I'll say. Um, the concluding thought I have, hardly a conclusion, uh, perhaps is actually directly, um, a consequence of, of, of Kyle mentioning my podcast episode of, of what happened to Tobias, because in the beginning, um, when I gave my coherent singular thought, I had mentioned a, a friend who had died, to, had taken their own life in the midst of what appeared to be a drug induced psychosis. And that was Tobias. And so, um, when Kyle brought that up, it brought up a lot of memories and it brought up maybe a wondering about, about how many other people have, you know, di died at the hands of their crisis and, um, maybe a sense of, maybe a sense of hope or something that the fact that we all were able to get together and talk about this and each of you live in totally different places in different fields of work. And yet you're holding an, an understanding and that we're not necessarily a special few, you know, there are a lot of people doing this work that perhaps less people will end up dying at the hands of their crisis. Um, less and less people over time. Um, so with that said, I would like to thank each of you um, for coming in and participating in the psychedelic cafe today and for each of your uh, respectful areas of work. And uh, if you'd all like to unmute yourself at the same time, we can all say a, a nice goodbye as we close out this conversation for today. Thank this you. was amazing. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What a pleasure to meet all of you. <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, okay. thank you, everyone. And the cafe is now closed. And cut. Okay, that's this episode of the podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you found yourself excited or interested by any one or any of the uh, participants in this cafe, please head to jameswjessup.com, uh, cafe number six, and you will find the their bios and links to their work. You could also follow the link in the description to this episode wherever you're checking it out to go over there. If you are appreciating what the show is about uh, and you'd like to contribute financially, Patreon is a great option, as well as PayPal donations or Bitcoin donations. Links to all of those are also in the description to this episode. And to leave you here, if you are somebody who is experiencing presently a spiritual crisis and that's why you reached to this episode, I truly genuinely hope you find the help and support that you need to pass through it and that this episode was helpful for you. And uh, on that note to everyone, thank you for tuning in and I will see you on the next episode. Take care.